Welcome to Fixing C. My name is Timothy Lattis and this is the Neo Kino Graphics Channel. If you're looking for a language nanny, this is probably not the talk for you. This is more for unconventional thinkers. It's about getting the language out of the way, a celebration of freedom, so one can focus on getting hardcore coding done. This is from my perspective, what I've learned and what I like to use. What works for you could be completely different, but hopefully you'll get something out of this talk. Let's fix the C language without changing the language. Instead, we'll use macros, type defs, and tools inside the language. Let's also address the myth. C is not a portable assembly language. Prefer to use GCC on Windows. Decouple from MSVC. GCC has a bunch of advantages you'll see in later slides. Let's start with some base simplification macros. Almost all of my simplifications start with some capital letter, followed by an underscore, and then some arguments. I keep them small because they're used often. I have some for alignment. I have one that simplifies built-in expects so the compiler knows the common branch path. I have a short version of static. I have a pair, I and N, for forced inline and forced no inline. I prefer to be explicit with the compiler, tell it exactly what I want. I also have another pair, R and V. These are for pointers. We'll see later what they're for. And then finally, W. This one is for imports, Win32 imports. I prefer to have something like C minus minus for types. I don't want type checking, especially signed un unsigned checking. Instead, I want integer types. I want them to default to unsigned behavior. And I'll use functions that take unsigned values to do signed ops when I need to do that. I prefer to avoid the parentheses salad. There's a lot of ways you can write something. The easy way, or the standard way, I don't know, looks kind of busy to me. I prefer something smaller, something more concise. Let's start with some base simplification type defs. These, this time, for types. These have the syntax, an optional capital S for signed, followed by a single capital letter for a type, followed by the number of components. Number of components is so it has portability with GLSO. We'll see that later. Let's default to unsigned integers. So I don't use a U as default, it's just not there. We only use S when we actually want explicit signed types. The rest of this is pretty simple. F for float, D for W, B for byte, W for word, i.e. 16-bit, I for integer, i.e. 32-bit, L for long, 64-bit. I like to share my syntax with the GLSL. In GLSL, there's some additions. I use H for 16-bit float, aka half, and I use P for predicate, not B for bool, as bool is used for byte. Let's continue with some simplified typecasts. I can typecast anything via type underscore. These defines our setup for every single type. Note, with ASM like programming in C, there's going to be a lot of typecasts. So I like to make it easy to read. For the rare case, I need a signed operation, like comparisons, for instance. I have a bunch of functions that are inline that will do reinterpretation. So I'll take unsigned arguments interpret them as signed, do the operation, and then return an unsigned result. As for pointers, I want the same thing. I want C minus minus. I don't like pointers in C because they're always indexed by type. I prefer to work with bytes, you know, like a regular address, 64-bit address. I also don't like the default C behavior of non-restricted pointers. I want something explicitly either restrict or do what I say volatile, and nothing else. I'll only specify the type at the point of access, say a load or store. Let's look at how I'm going to do this. First, I have the defines, the R and the V underscore from before. And then I have type capital R for restrict and type capital V for volatile pointers. So for instance, if I want a float single component restricted pointer, I do F1R. 
there you go. Very simple, very concise. So when I want to use these and I need to do some conversion, say a 64-bit pointer, and I want to grab, let's say, a float again, what I'll do is I'll put F1R underscore, and that'll do my type conversion. So just like everything else, the type with the underscore I have used for typecast. This I'd say is minimum readiness, now I'm ready to program. Here's an example of pointer usage. For one thing, I don't like to overload the star. I prefer using the star just for multiply. If I want to use anything that's, you know, working on a pointer, I'm going to use index by zero. If I need to actually use indexing, obviously the zero will change to something else. Below are a few examples of how I use pointers. Let's move on to some other advanced interfaces. These are all easy with GCC. We can either use built-ins or we can use inline assembly. Both are very, very useful. So for all the barriers, I have four forms, compiler barrier, memory barrier, read barrier, write barrier, they're all there. For atomics, I also prefer using inline assembly. I prefer getting the actual machine ops and knowing what those are. I really don't like any silly abstraction. If it's an abstraction, then I have to go compile it, look in a debugger, check out the disassembly, then the true understanding shows up. But if I have them as pure inline assembly, I know exactly what's happening right from the beginning. When interfacing with Win32, I don't use any includes. I just write out the associated imports, i.e. the pieces of a header file that I need to actually use. I also get rid of the typing. For instance, I get rid of pointers and make them back into L1, i.e. 64-bit unsigned integer. So an example, a very, very simple example, what I'm using for the library interface on Win32, get proc address and load library A, you notice almost all the arguments, well, they're all unsigned int, 64 bits. And then my version, I rename them with inline functions so that if I'm working on Linux, I can have a different function for these. All right, so let's go through some tangents. I mostly don't free anything. Create everything at a knit time and leave it forever. Allow the process termination to close and free stuff. That's the reason why I don't do the free library thing. It's just not necessary. Also, mostly I don't use any external libraries. I just use the traditional system Win32 interfaces. Those are all libraries, and that's it. In the rare case I need a non-Win32 library, such as Vulkan, I just load library, and then I don't do any dynamic linking to it. Another thing I do, a single source file. Everything's in one file. If I need to do any source reordering, what I do is I have a re-include system. I have four passes, def for define, typ for type defs, ram for something in the global data structure, and rom, last pass for all the code. Note all my data, it's all global, and it's all in one giant structure. It's very easy to use, keeps it quite simple. All right, so, Note, I mix GLSL with C in one file. This works for various reasons. One can easily mix all the GLSL and C with defines. You can share code, you can share defines. Makes the code quite easy to work with. I use a few defines for this. I use CPU underscore, dev underscore, and GPU underscore for the associated usage in here. Let's go through an implementation. This one starts with if not defined pre, then I define pre, so it only happens once. Then I set my CPU, dev, and GPU defines up to be zero if they're not predefined already in the batch file. Next, I check if it's the CPU. If it is, I set my four passes, the defines I use for the four passes, def, type, ram, and rom, to zero. After the pre section, I can put in APU or shared CPU, GPU defines and source code in one section wrapped by a NIF def. And then I have the GPU stuff also wrapped by a NIF. 
And then I have this section for C self include, and I'll show you that in the next few slides. And then followed by the C stuff. So for C self includes, I have something very similar to before. First check if it's the CPU and if I didn't do the bot. Bot as in boot, define boot so it happens once. And then each of the four sections are pretty similar. They all start with an undef, a define one, self include, an undef, a define zero. So this one's showing the, the one for def and the one for type. Next one, this one is for RAM. It's a little different. This one wraps the self include with the type def struct. That way everything that's in those sections gets put in this giant RAM T structure. This is the green section. The RAM T ends with an aligned 64 bit, aka one cache line, four megabytes. Note, you can add padding in here. It could be four megabytes, it could be 16 megabytes, it doesn't really matter. This is all in the B0 section, meaning it's not actually throwing zeros into your binary. It's just getting auto zeroed when the program starts. Next thing we have is we have the RAM M, which is where the actual memory is put. That's the variable to access it. This one's also cache line aligned. And then I have two defines, one for RAM R and one for RAM V. RAM R is for restricted access and the RAM V is for volatile access. As for the section for code, the ROM section, this one's also a little different. I have some no inline functions, warm base and warm end, which wrap all the code, which gives me the beginning and the end of the code segment. This way I can use it for page warming. And that's it. Once we get done with that section, now we have the CPU code. Typically I set up the CPU code in different modules. Each module, if it has defines, imports, code, data, they all get put in these pound if sections. This one's showing an example for, say, stuff that runs on Windows only. As for development, I work in two terminal windows. Then I have a Notepad 2 for editing. For the editor, I don't really need anything complicated under Windows. I just want something with syntax highlighting and good search functionality. That's it. Don't need tab completion. Don't need any of that stuff. The two terminal windows are running different batch scripts, one that loops and recompiles the executable. Then it runs the executable, assuming the compile without error. Then it waits for the source file to change, and then it repeats the process. This way, all I have to do is save the file and it automatically reruns. I don't have to do anything like open up a new window and type in a command to actually, you know, compile it. Don't need it. If I have an error, I just look at the error in the terminal window, alt tab back to the editor, change some stuff, save it, and the process continues. The second thing I have is another terminal, which loops regenerating the spear v binary. Now, in my case, all the shader kernels are in the same spear v file. I'm using spec contents, or no, sorry, spec constants to actually select the code path at compile time. And what I mean by compile time is taking the module and building a PSO. This one has a similar loop and recompile as the source file changes. Therefore, when the AXE is running and I'm changing shader code, I can actually go alt tab to it if I get an error look at the, you know, the errors, fix the errors, do a control S for save, and then the develop executable picks up the shader changes, and I just keep working like that. Note if it ever crashes, that's fine too, because it'll just rerun the executable. And if your executable launches in, say, a second, you have a really fast setup there. Here's the batch file. This one is to do the GCC section to make the executable. You notice the orange section, that one's for checking the F time, checking if it's changed. And the green section here is what I'm using for compile. There's another batch file, this time for the GLSL to Spear V part. This one similar, I got the orange for checking the F time of the p.c source file. And then the green section is doing all the stuff to generate the GLSL to Spear V. Notice there's two commands in here. 
the standard GLS Lang validator to do the compile. And then after that, I run spearv opt. And you'll note I call it k.bloat.spearv when the GLS Lang validator runs it because the output is extremely bloated. And the vendor compilers really don't like working with that bloated output. For instance, you have the module, that module's loaded. The compiler, the vendor compiler doesn't do any optimizations on loaded modules. Every time you build a PSO from the loaded module, it's going to go through that huge bloated file, spear v source, and that's going to cost a lot. In my case, I was seeing something like 10x, you know, cost for not running it through spear v opt. So I always run it through spear v opt. And that's that. Well, ready to start driving. This is a start towards serious programming. More next time. Take care.